there's a bigger reason here. And in order for you to understand this, I have to tell you a little story, okay? So years and years and years ago, I was an agency nurse. You know how when you were in high school and your teacher couldn't show up on that particular day because they were sick or had a doctor's appointment or whatever, you ended up with a substitute teacher, not your regular teacher, but somebody that just kind of filled in. Well, in healthcare, we call these substitute nurses agency nurses. So they don't work for the facility. These aren't their normal patients. They are just uh, fill-in nurses. So I was working as an agency nurse and I was assigned to go to a long-term care facility that had a rehab section on it. And as I'm going through doing my assessments, uh, passing my medications, I walked into a patient's room. I've got a couple of pills in my hand. And when I walked into the patient's room, I flipped the light on as I entered because it was a, it was very dark in the room. The guy had one small light just above his bed, but that was it. Just one small fluorescent light and all the rest of the lights were off. So as I walked in, because I knew I had to do an assessment, I flipped the light on and he starts yelling right away. Turn it off, turn it off. So I turned the, the light off and came closer to the bed and I said, Henry, my name is Patty. I'm your nurse today. Can I ask why you didn't want the light on? Do you have a headache or you're not feeling well? What's going on? And he says, no, no, I have diabetic retinopathy and the bright light hurts my eyes. I don't like the big light on. I said, okay, no problem. Here's your pills. Can I take a, a quick look at you? I've got to do a quick assessment. And as I'm standing there talking to him, I catch an odor. Now, if you've ever smelled a wound, you know they're very distinctive. And once you smell one, you know, anytime you smell that again, that there's a wound brewing somewhere. So I convinced him to let me take a quick peek um, because I, I really did think he had some sort of a wound somewhere. And I turned him over and I looked at all the usual suspects, you know, the tips of the ears, the shoulder blades, the lower back or coccyx area, the back of his legs, his hips. I get down to his feet. All the rest of the skin is fine. I get down to his feet. And of course, that's where the wound has got to be because that's all that's left. And I asked him, you know, he had those little slipper socks on, you know, the kind with the little dots, you know, the, the paint dots on the bottom to keep you from slipping. He had those slipper socks on. And I asked him, you know, Henry, can I take your socks off real quick so I can look at your feet? And he immediately said, no. Okay, so there's my red flag. First of all, this is the only place the wound can be because I've looked at everything else. But if he's telling me no, he doesn't want me to take the socks off, then I know that he has told the CNAs no when they asked to take his socks off. So we don't know how long this guy had gone without anyone looking at his feet or just doing basic body maintenance with his feet. So I sweet talked him because you can always get further with patients by being nice than being mean, always. So if you turn up the charm, you can get patients to do what you need them to do a whole lot quicker. So I did. I turned up the charm and I got him to agree to let me take his socks off and look at his feet. I took the left sock off and, and it was, you know, the skin was a little flaky, but it was still in okay shape. Definitely needed to be washed in some lotion, but not no wounds. When I went to take the right sock off, it was stuck to the bottom of his foot. Well, there's my problem. I found it, but I can't get the sock off to see what I'm dealing with. So I go get a big basin of salt water. We call it normal saline. And I put the whole foot, sock and all, in the basin to soften it up so I can take the sock off to see what I'm working with. What, what kind of wound am I dealing with here? And about 10 minutes later, I came back in, put my gloves on. I went to take the sock off. And as I did something, as I, it was really stuck to the bottom of the foot. So I kind of had to, to kind of give a little bit of a, a pressure to get that sock off. And as I did, something went flying past my head and I, and I could hear it and I could feel it give way. That's, that's a bad sign. So I start looking, oh, one, two, three, four, five, all of his toes were there. That's a good sign, no problem there. But what went flying off of his foot? And up next to the baseboard, 
the floor was, you know, like what you would see in a clinical setting, you know, like the speckled, like what I have in here. And up next to the baseboard was one of those flat, round, white painted thumbtacks. You know the kind I'm talking about, the metal, not the push pens with the plastic. These are the flat thumbtacks. And it had been in his foot, we don't know how long, no idea. But what was left was an area on his foot, probably about that big around, that was hard black dead tissue. Now we're good in medicine. I mean, we can heal a lot of things. Medicine come, has come a long way in 250 years. We can heal a lot of things. But dead is dead. We can't bring stuff back from the dead. And when tissue dies, it's dead. And that's what I was looking at here. I'm looking at dead tissue and that's not good. So I feel really bad for this poor guy. And, you know, of course I have to call the doctor. I have to call the wound care specialist. I've got to get wound care orders. I have to do wound care on it. I've got to write up my notes, take my pictures, a whole lot of stuff had to happen here. And then I left end of the shift, not my patient, not my facility. But this guy stayed on my mind for a long time. And he was, he was in the rehab section, but he was only in his late 50s. And that's super young to have body part issues like that. So about, I don't know, eight, 10 months later, I don't know the exact time frame, but it was less than a year later, <clears throat> agency nurse, I get assigned back to that facility. But this time I'm on the long-term care side, not the rehab side, the long-term care side. And as I'm going about, I notice his name. So he had been transferred from the rehab side to the long-term care side, and that's not good. So I go in, knock, knock, knock. Hi, Henry, I'm Patty. I'm the nurse that found the wound on your foot, and I'm back today. I just wanted to see how you were doing. Well, I pulled the sheet aside, and he had had to have a below-the-knee amputation. And this is tragic. I mean, this guy was only in his late 50s, and he's already lost a leg. That's horrible. And what made this really horrible is that it was preventable. We're going to get to that in a minute. But the next question that all of you guys have right now, and you're dying to ask, is how in the world can this guy have a thumbtack in the bottom of his foot and not know it's there? How does that even happen? Well, you and I, if we stepped on a thumbtack, we would surely know it, and we would hop around and go, ow, 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 and we'd pull it out, and we'd doctor it up, and we'd go about our lives, and we probably wouldn't give it a second thought. But the problem is that this guy gave us a huge clue in the very beginning of the story. I said he had diabetic retinopathy. Now, that means that he has diabetes and it has affected the very small blood vessels in his eyes and the sugar crystals have accumulated in those small blood vessels and, and on the nerves and it um, impedes his ability to see properly. But what that tells us is he has diabetes. So in order to understand what that means, I've got to give you just a little brief fifth grade lesson on diabetes. So this is super simplified, okay? But when, you, when your body takes in carbs, so think of carbs like bread, pasta, sugar, anything made with sugar, flour, anything made with flour, um, rice, we call it the rule of white, if it's white, you need to look at it as a potential carb. There are very few white things that are not carbs. Cauliflower is one that comes to mind. But most, the rule of white is if it's white, you got to look at it as a potential carb. Carbs are not bad, right? Carbs get a horribly bad rap in our community, in our society. They really do, but they're not bad guys. They aren't. Your body needs a certain amount of carbs to live. So what happens is when you eat carbs, let's say that you eat a plate of spaghetti, okay? Those carbs go into your digestive system and they get broken apart and made into sugar molecules, okay? So those carbs get broken apart into sugars. 
Well, that's actually good news because every cell in your body runs on sugar. It's a fuel source. It's great stuff. And carbs is the easiest and most efficient fuel for your body to run on. So carbs get a bad rap. They're really not bad. They're bad in excess. And boy, our American diet is excessive with our carbs. But carbs themselves are not bad because they provide us a quick source of energy. So what happens is you eat a carb, it breaks it down into components, and some of those components, the sugar molecules, need to be used by the cells of your body. Great stuff. Well, those sugar molecules get pushed into the bloodstream to circulate all throughout your body and enter cells along the way. But they can't just enter those cells on their own. Those cells are actually locked. The cells have a door on them, and that door requires a key. So the sugar molecules that are circulating around your body, okay, they've got to be able to get inside the cell. So if you uh, have a um, good functioning system, okay, not diabetic, then your pancreas, when you take in carbs and your body starts breaking those carbs down into its, its components, it triggers your pancreas, says, hey, we've got some carbs on board, gonna need some keys for those doors. And the pancreas produces the keys that those sugar molecules are gonna need to unlock the door and get into the cell, okay? So your pancreas does this, it's called insulin. That's the key that your sugar needs to get into the cell. And in a well-functioning person, that's exactly what happens. The carbs break down into your body, go into the bloodstream, your insulin gets inserted into the bloodstream, Insulin unlocks a cell, the sugar enters the cell, provides a quick source of fuel, life is good. Now, where this goes off track is if you eat too many carbs, and we like carbs in our American society. So when you eat too many carbs, we can only use so much of that sugar that we uh, got from the carbs. So, you know, your cells are now well fed, there's excess sugar, spinning around your, your system, all of your arteries and veins. And, and sugar is not something that you can just like excrete when you, you know, eat too much of it. It has to go somewhere. So what happens is as the sugar makes a couple of trips around and your body realizes, okay, that's excess, we don't need that, it's got to store it somewhere. So it takes this excess sugar, it packs it up, into fat molecules and it stores it in your fat system for later. That way, if you don't have carbs later on, we can unpack that storage unit and now we've got a ready source of energy. So you eat carbs, I'm talking a well-functioning system, you eat carbs, whatever you can use goes into your cells because the insulin unlocks the cells, the um, glucose goes in, and then whatever's left gets packaged up and stored for later. Now. In a diabetic individual, where this system goes off track is the fact that they don't produce keys. So you eat carbs, carbs gets broken down into sugar, and your brain tells your pancreas, hey, we need some keys, and the pancreas says, nope, not gonna do it. I'm off today, not working, can't help you. That is, um, that's a serious problem. Or you can have a different type of diabetes where the pancreas says on it, but instead of producing house keys, it's making car keys. They don't help us at all. It, it produces insulin, but it's the wrong kind of insulin, something that doesn't open up our cells. So either way, the end result is the same. We have all of the sugar running around the system and nowhere for it to go. Well, remember, we will pack some of it up into storage units, but we run out of storage units pretty quickly. And all of this sugar is just circulating and circulating and circulating. Remember I said you can't excrete this. It's got to go somewhere. So what ends up happening is it starts to coat the inside of the arteries and it'll coat the outside of the nerves. So you end up with this 
horribly malfunctioned system where you eat in carbs, your body breaks it down, but now we can't do anything with that sugar. Now, why is this a problem? Well, have you ever made a cake or had cupcakes that you left on the, out on the counter for a couple of days? The frosting on top of that cupcake is going to get a little bit grainy and a little bit oily. Well, that is what glucose is like on a molecular level. Okay, so they're like sharp little crystals. So you have all of these sharp crystals in your system going round and round and round, and eventually they get tired and they're going to land on the inside of your arteries. Well, these sharp crystals are going to catch anything that's floating by. So it's going to catch cholesterol, which looks like pizza cheese, guys. If you looked at cholesterol under the, the microscope, it looks like pizza cheese. So now you've got these sharp crystals and you've got this pizza cheese in it. And those crystals are gonna shred cells as they go by. So you end up with red blood cells that get shredded and white blood cells that get shredded. So you, you have these like cell fragments everywhere. And it makes an absolute gloopy mess inside the arteries. Well, over time, that builds up. So when we're young and we're brand new, our arteries look like this. That's a really nice artery. I mean, it's wide open. It's, that's a beautiful artery. But as we go through life, we realize that carbs taste really good. And this starts early in life, right? A two-year-old will eat cereal, but they're not eating Raisin Bran. They're eating Fruity Pebbles and Lucky Charms and Captain Crunch and Kicks. And there's a lot of carbs in those cereals. So remember, carbs break down into sugar. So you got a lot of sugar going around the system. And then snack time comes around. And mom, great mom, mom feeds the child fruit for a snack, but fruit has a lot of fructose or sugar in it. So now we got sugar going around and around and around and around. And remember, every time there's sugar, the pancreas has to make keys. So the pancreas is working hard. Now it's lunchtime. So we're going to have a peanut butter and jelly on bread, which are carbs. So now we need more insulin and more sugar going around and around and around and around. And then it's snack time. So now we're going to get a little Debbie or a Pop-Tart or something sweet. And that, those are carbs. So that breaks down into sugar and the sugar goes around and around and around and around. And at dinner time, we're going to make chicken nuggets and mac and cheese because that is the universal toddler meal in America. And those are all carbs. So now we have more sugar go round, around, around, around. And now it's almost bedtime. We got to go, we got to have dessert before we go to bed. And those are going to be ice cream or cookies or candy or carbs that breaks down into sugar. And that sugar goes round and round and round and round. And tomorrow we're going to do it all again. And then we get to be teenagers and we decide that we want to live on pizza and french fries. And those are all carbs. So our body gets used to this overabundance of carbs. And that produces a ton of sugar that the body has to deal with, right? So by the time we're a teenager, our arteries look more like this. And you end up with a little bit of, I know it's kind of hard to see, it's a little blurry. You end up with a little bit of um, buildup in that artery. Now, if we don't change our ways and start bringing in a few more vegetables, a few more salads, a little bit less carbs in our diet, by the time we get into our 30s and 40s, then our arteries look more like this, right? So we end up with a lot of goop on the inside of our arteries, and that's no good. That, that just, that, that reduces blood flow, right? How much blood do you think can get through that with all of that goop in the way? Not much blood. Now, as we get older into our 50s and 60s, as we develop diabetes, because remember, every time you ate carbs, it made your pancreas produce keys. Over time, that pancreas is going to get tired and worn out, and it's just not going to have the materials it needs anymore to function appropriately. And this is how we develop diabetes. 
So now we've got a lot of sugar in our body and we can't even package it up anymore in our fat cells. We can't process it in our cells. So our arteries look more like that. How much good blood do you think is gonna get through there? That's right. Yeah, there's going to be very little blood in there. Very little. So if we have a, um, if we have an injury somewhere, we're not going to be able to get good blood to that injury to heal it. And this is why diabetics are often slow to heal. But that those excess sugar molecules don't just coat the inside of the artery. I mean, that, that's bad enough. If it stopped there, that would be bad enough, but it doesn't stop there. These uh, sugar molecules will actually coat the outside of nerves too. So we end up with a situation like Henry, who stepped on a thumbtack and his foot knew the thumbtack was there. But the problem is that that nerve, that line that connected his foot to his brain, that nerve was coated with crud. So even though the foot is like, hey, dude, there's something in me, get it out, it hurts, that signal could not get all the way to the brain for the brain to know that there was a problem going on. So when we have diabetic patients, they can have injuries that they're not even aware of. Something that you and I would be like hopping around on one foot going, ow, 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 your patient may not have any awareness that they have that problem at all because the signal can't make it through. See, humans are still hardwired. We aren't wireless. There's, there's nothing that can, through the air, go from the foot to the brain. It actually has to travel through a physical wire, which is your nerve. If the nerves are all coded, you're not going to know that there's a problem. Now, this happens in the body in two very specific places, and that all has to do with gravity, right? This is the Isaac Newton day. We talk about gravity a lot today. Well, when you are standing up, the two lowest points on your upper body, if you stand just like this, okay, the two lowest points of your upper body are your hands. The lowest points of your lower body are your feet. So what ends up happening, because these crystals are heavy, right? These sugar molecules are way heavier than anything else in the blood. It's going to get pulled down by gravity to the lowest points of your body, which are your hands and your feet. And this is why foot care needs to be done. Because your patients, if they're diabetic, can have a lot of foot problems and not even realize that they're there. Now, when you're younger, you're pretty bendy. You can look at all areas of your body with relative ease because your foot will actually bend so you can see the bottom of it. As you get older, you are less bendy. People that are quite a bit older are gonna have a really hard time seeing the bottom of their feet if, if they can see it at all. So they're gonna rely on us to look at the areas that are no longer visible to them. And this is why foot care is so important because you may have a patient that doesn't have the ability to know if there's a problem because of this diabetic uh, nerve impairment, or you can have a patient who is not as bendy and can't see that there's a problem. Either way, there's a problem that the patient doesn't know about and that's where we come in. So you are gonna be asked to do foot care, generally speaking, on every patient that you have at least once a week to identify any problems that may exist. But let's go back to Henry for just a second. What made this completely tragic for me is the fact that it was 100% preventable. If somebody had just put shoes on Henry's feet before he walked wherever it was that he went, that thumbtack would have been in the bottom of the shoe and we don't have to amputate shoes 
right? A thumbtack in the bottom of a shoe is not a danger to the patient. A thumbtack to the bottom of the foot can cost you your foot. And that is a huge deal. It's 100% preventable. Those shoes are a 15 second insurance policy. If you've got a patient who has um, a cardiac problem, like a heart problem, and their heart does not pump well, which means that we might not, might not have good blood going to all the areas of the body it needs to go, then we need to have shoes on that patient because they may not be able to feel their feet very well. If we have a diabetic patient, we need to have shoes on their feet because they may not be able to feel what's under their feet very well. If they have a muscular problem, we need shoes on their feet. If they have a neurological problem, we need shoes on their feet. Basically, if they have feet, they need shoes. If they're going to be on their feet, then their shoes need to be on. So our rule here, we're talking here, these are shoe rules. Our rule here is if the patient's feet hit the floor, we got to talk about their shoes. We can't just assume that the evaluator knows that we know this concept. We actually have to say it. So we have to say something like, I see you're wearing shoes. Or are your shoes uh, tied appropriately? Do your shoes fit well? You have to say something about shoes. Or you have shoes on, we're safe to walk. However you want to put it, I don't care. But you have to somehow acknowledge that shoes are important. This goes a step further. Anybody ever go to the hospital as a patient or have you ever seen somebody in the hospital as a patient, right? The very first thing they give you is a hospital gown and a pair of slipper socks. And that's like the standard issue, standard uniform for all hospital patients. You get a gown and slipper socks, no matter what, no matter why you're there. So we are really good patients. We go into the bathroom, we put on our little gown, we put on our slipper socks and we're happy, right? Well, here's the problem with slipper socks. <laughs> they don't protect your feet. Now, in healthcare, we use sharp objects all the time, all the time. We use sharp objects to draw blood, to start IVs, to make incisions, to sew up incisions. We have more sharp objects in healthcare than any other setting ever. Now, would you let your child walk around barefoot in a hospital setting knowing that there are sharp objects that could potentially fall on the floor? No, you wouldn't. You would make sure that your child had shoes on to walk in that environment because you want to keep your little, little precious feet safe. Well, if we wouldn't do it for children, then why in the world would we allow adults to do that? Why do we think it's okay to put slipper socks on a patient and let them walk around freely knowing that there could be a needle that fell on the floor that could stab them in the foot? It's not, it, it's not right. It's not appropriate. It, it's not good at all. But there's another problem here that I bet you never thought of. So I'm going to turn the camera off for a second. I'm going to turn this around and I'm going to show you something that's probably going to make you think twice. Okay. So let's say, for giggles, that I am a person who had a gallbladder surgery this morning. I went to an outpatient surgery center. The doctor did the surgery with a robot, and I've got four little incisions on my tummy that are covered in Band-Aids. And I was supposed to go home at the end of the day, right? It's, it's, it's a one-day, same-day surgery procedure. I go in in the morning, I have my surgery, they watch me for a couple hours, and then I get to go home. But unfortunately, my blood pressure was a little bit high after surgery, and they didn't feel comfortable letting me go home with a blood pressure that high, so they kept me in the hospital for observation overnight. And this is the bed they gave me. So I've got my little patient gown on, I've got my slipper socks on, and I can do everything myself. I can feed myself, I can brush my own teeth, I can go to the bathroom by myself. The only reason that I'm here is because of my blood pressure. So I've got my patient gown and my slipper socks on and I climb into bed, right? And I watch TV for a while 
And this is my roommate over here. This lady over here, she had um, a hip replacement surgery done two days ago. And unfortunately, she developed an infection afterwards and she was put on antibiotics and she can't get out of bed. She's still way too weak. And one of the unfortunate side effects of the antibiotics is it caused diarrhea. Now the CNAs are great. They come over, they take care of her, they get her cleaned up, they change her sheets, but there's no dirty hamper in the room. So they just throw the sheets on the ground in between our beds while they clean her up. And then they bundle the sheets up and take them out when they're done. Well, eventually, after flipping through channels for a couple of hours, I realize I have to go to the bathroom. So I get out of bed with my little slipper socks on, and I walk to the bathroom with my slipper socks on, and I walk back to bed with my slipper socks on, and then I get into bed with those slipper socks on. Now, what else got into bed with me, do you think? That's right, bacteria fecal matter that is on the floor. Now, if you remember, I have four incisions on my tummy that are covered with a Band-Aid. I mean, they're not even like completely covered, right? Because Band-Aids are open like underneath. So these bacteria that are now in bed with me on the sheets, as I toss and I turn, the bacteria that are on my slipper socks are gonna get moved higher and higher and higher and higher on those sheets. And they're gonna eventually get to an area where they may be able to invade my incisions. And remember, incisions are warm, dark, moist. The ideal environment for bacteria. So when you have a patient who is in a clinical setting, slipper socks are not enough for walking around. Now, I'm gonna ask you a question that's probably going to make you ill. How many of you have ever been a patient in a hospital? How many of you walked around the room or walked down the hallway or walked outside in those slipper socks and then got back into bed with them on. So we need to be aware that slipper socks are not sufficient. They don't keep the patients safe. They're not good for sharps prevention. They're not good, they're, they're not even good to prevent slips and falls because those slipper socks always turn around and you end up on a slippery, slippery part. They're not good at preventing slips and falls. They're not good at infection control. They're not good at preventing Sharps injury. They're just not good, period. There is no substitute for having shoes. And chances are your patient has shoes there. All you have to do is find the shoes. So if you, um, if you look in their bedside drawer, in their closet, under their bed, chances are most people have shoes there. If you don't have shoes, let the nurse know and the nurse can contact the facility the patient came from or the family of the patient and say, hey, can you bring George's shoes in next time you come? Um, it's minimizing the risk to the patient. That's really the name of the game here.